that, that was the panel that um, is allegedly from one of the crashed disks either at Roswell, Corona, or Aztec, New Mexico. The, the one at, at Roswell, and I'll give you the story. The, a rancher went out to his ranch, you know, in, in New Mexico. If you own a ranch, you got to own like 5,000 acres just to feed cattle. So he's got a big spread, and he goes out, and he sees all this debris laying everywhere. So he calls the sheriff or a local policeman, something like that. They come out, look at it. They, there is an Army Air Force base near Roswell, New Mexico. And understand that it was it, at the time, in 1947, it was the only place in the entire world where atomic bombs were. Okay? That was it. It was the Roswell Army Air Force Base. So later on, the Air Force separated from the Army. So they had protecting the air base at Roswell and those atomic weapons, protecting that, they had the most sophisticated radar system that anybody had anywhere at the time because they feared that at some point the Russians or somebody will want one of these things to tear it apart, find out how it works, and then they'll have it. So they're very well protected. And... Um, I don't know how far to get into this, but the theory is that the radar affected the ships, causing them to crash into one another. The Roswell ship, being in pieces, uh, was the first one discovered. The Army immediately releases a press release saying, we have a flying saucer found near Roswell, New Mexico. That went out in the papers and was announced over the radio. We have the evidence of that. Of that. The next day, the army changed its story, just like that, and said that wasn't a UFO, that wasn't a flying saucer. So they sent this guy out, Jesse Marcel, with the pieces of this weather balloon and said, that's what it was. Okay, so they changed their story. Um, a while later, the one at, I think, Corona was found, and then a, I think a year later, the one at Aztec was found. But all three of them, they figured, had crashed at the same time. It just took a while for the one at Aztec. Now, I don't know, you know, which one supposedly this is from, but let me explain to you how this, turn your Bible to Ezekiel 1, and I'll, I'll explain to you, I think, from the Bible, how this thing works this this kind of stuff fascinates me and i've been fascinated with it my whole life and i've always believed that aliens were devils my mama raised me right okay raised me in church so that was my thinking and uh but for years you know, when I'm doing Watchmen broadcasts, I don't really want to talk about it because I, I have these series, but I don't know for sure. So when I really began to study and investigate it, um, God has helped me understand, I believe, from the scriptures what it is we're seeing. You ask the question, are UFOs real? And I introduced this to a church a few weeks ago in Pea Ridge, Arkansas. Good people, love the Lord, love the Bible, but I asked them, Back in January, I was preaching one night there. How many of you believe in UFOs? And not very many people raised their hand. I said, how many of you are too afraid to admit you believe in UFOs? Of course, nobody raised their hand then because they were afraid. Okay, so I just said, I think God's leading me to do this. The watchman must tell the people what to watch for. If just one story about UFOs is real, what does that mean? Okay? And there has to be an answer in the Bible. I believe an answer to everything. Jeremiah 33, 3 is my favorite verse. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. So I ask God questions and I irritate him with them. I'm not, God, I'm not going to quit asking until you give me the answer. So, 
the, the theory is that the saucers are alive. Now, if you don't, if you, if you're going, that just does not compute in my brain. The cars that you're going to drive in, let's say, eight years from now are going to be AI, self-driving, autonomous thinking machines. My insurance agent said, he said, I just came back from a meeting a shelter of shelter agents, and they discussed when cars become autonomous, not if, and one of them crashes, who's liable? Because if they drive themselves, the driver's not liable. He didn't crash it. Is it the software company? Is it the hardware company? Do we sue the car? Because we're getting into an age where machines are starting to think like us. AI. A living machine that is aware of itself. Yes. They just revealed the news like a couple days ago, uh, a new age of computing called neuromorphic computers. Yep. And they're modeled after the human brain. Think about it. We're creating a God after our image. That's a bad God. If he's like us, we're doomed. So Elon Musk, he announced this. He came out several years ago and said, we're talking like devil possession. The AI is going to take over and every movie you've ever seen about the robots and the Terminator is going to be real and they're going to kill us because they're going to be superior to us. So you know what his solution is? He's working on and he has a working model now, a neural net that links the brain to the web so that we and AI are one entity. Singularity. Singularity. Now, you remember the image that the false prophet causes mankind to build? Does that image become alive? Absolutely. So I've just told you that these saucers were alive and the drivers the these devils would put their hands where you see there and they would communicate with the saucer and their will would become one with the saucer and that's how they would tell the saucer where to go and what to do now look in Ezekiel chapter 1 this is in the Bible what I just said to you is in the Bible Look at verse 15. And we have the four living creatures, which are what? They're angels, right? <laughs> now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And their four, they four had one likeness and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And verse 19 is, and verse 20 is the key. When the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. They're one, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Now look at verse 20. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, and underline this, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The wheels were alive and one with the living creature. And this in Ezekiel 1 is God's chariot. The Bible says the chariots, of the, and I'm going to show you this verse, the chariots of the Lord are 20,000, even thousands of angels. God's got 20,000 cars that are living beings. The, the chariots themselves are living creatures. Does that make sense now? 
So the car, I'm telling you, the car that you're going to drive in eight to ten years is going to be nearly alive and almost self-aware. And then it's going to get to the point to where it is going to be autonomous. And we're using AI right now as our servant. Siri. And you talk to Google and you ask these, it's always usually a female. You ask them, you asking God questions. Jarvis, like, yeah, uh, Iron Man. So right now these are our servants. But that's going to change. Right now, man has dominion over these beasts. But at some point, this beast is going to have dominion over man. It's going to be as God. And we're tr- we're, we are so used to treating this like a God. Tell me how to get to Old Paz Baptist Church. And it pulls it up. We're asking Google questions. Let me Google that. Let me ask it questions. Let me find out if it's going to rain tomorrow. Now we're using it as a prophecy voice. Like the Oracle at Delphi. Oracle is a computer company. Delphi is a computer company. The Oracle at Delphi was some women that you went in and asked them a question. They asked the the God of prophecy, Apollo, who is Apollyon, They asked him the question. He sent down words in an unknown tongue that those ladies would speak. And then the oracle, who was a priestess, would give the answer to whoever came in and brought the gift and paid the money. So now, do you understand when when I hear that they're telling me, or the story is, that the, the discs were actually living entities joined together with whatever creature was driving it that's right in your bible that that's that exists in the spiritual realm okay all right this is like freaky time back back in the 40s alistair crowley the beast himself performed a series of rituals that he called the ala mantra working working means ritual to get in contact with a high being and he got in contact with him found out his name lam l-a-m which means check this out the way who is jesus So who is this spirit or at least spirit of Antichrist? The Dalai Lama. See, lamb is a Tibetan word and the Dalai Lama is a a human representative of Lam, the way. And so he drew a picture of him. Now, it looks like this with the exception of the eyes, right? The story that I heard was that originally Crowley, if you look right here, it looks like the eyes at one time were huge and he he drew this in pencil, shaded it out and then drew smaller eyes. Okay. But the fact that Crowley brought this thing into our world in the 1940s, And then all of a sudden now, boom, these things are everywhere. Before Roswell, in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which is about an hour and a half south of where our church is, right down 55, 1941, a local minister got a call and said, we have... Uh, we've had a crash and there are bodies out here and we need you to come out and pray last rites over them. So he went out there. And what he didn't see was an airplane. What he saw was a disc. 
and a bunch of army soldiers surrounding it. And he saw three short bodies, big heads, big eyes, spindly arms and legs. And he prayed last rites over them, but they were dead. And the army, one of the guys came to him and said, you are going to forget everything you just saw here. Because we know where you live. We know who your family is. And we're telling you, you're going to forget everything you saw here. On his deathbed, he told this story. Okay? So, something happened where all of a sudden now, there is an entrance into our world by something. So, what are they? This is Colonel Philip Corso. He was a um, World War II veteran. He was in counterintelligence, and he was stationed right after the war in Italy um, to make sure that the Italians did everything they were supposed to do. You know, during, after World War II, we kept our military, we kept all of our army and Marines and everybody in Germany, in Italy, in France to make sure that the armies didn't rise back up and try to fight us again. So Corso was stationed in Italy for a while. Then he came back to the States. And he was at an air base in Kansas, stationed there. And a convoy of trucks came by late July, 1947. They spent the night at that air base. Corso said he went out to see what they were carrying. And one of the guards said, uh, Colonel, I'm going to show you this. This ain't, this ain't real. This is, there's something ain't right here. So he lifted up the lid up and he saw in this fluid one of these gray, spindly, short, big-headed, big black-eyed, dead aliens. And he just stored that in the back of his head. Later on, he's stationed at the Pentagon. He's working under General Trudeau at the Pentagon. Trudeau calls him in his office and said, Corso, I'm going to turn something over to you. I'm going to retire and then I'm going to die, but I'm going to turn this over to you. And it was a filing cabinet that was full of records, documents, and pieces of the crashed, one of the crashed ships. And Trudeau told him, Corso, I want you to take this stuff. We have various contract we have various corporations that contract with the government they have top secret clearance i want you to give this to them have them find out what it does how it can be used for the army to have an advantage this is technology that we have never seen before they can take what they learn from it and patent it and use it for their own if they want but we want the technology so we can have an advantage this was in the middle of the cold war Okay, we want stuff that the Russians don't have. So that's what he did. And his claim in the, he wrote the book the day after Roswell. His claim is that some of the technology that we have now actually came from these crashed ships. Now this is, and I've, I've watched interviews with him on camera. He's now dead. But his whole idea was, why are we keeping this secret? Give this to the young people. Give this to the world. They need this technology. So this is not like there's a guy that's shrouded in black and we can't see his face and we're going to cover his voice and we won't tell his name, but he says he was at Roswell. This is not anything like that. This is a guy who came out, wrote a book and said, this is what I did. This is what I saw. And I'm telling the truth. So he put his reputation on the line to release this information. Does anybody know who this is? Um, Betty and Barney Hill. Betty and Barney Hill. Okay. Uh, they lived up in New England. They were a mixed race couple back in the 60s. You know, that wasn't accepted in too many places. They were traveling home one night, late at night. They saw a bright object in the sky. They pulled over to see what it was. They remember seeing this illuminated disc come down in front of them. Next thing they know, they're driving back on the road again, and they've lost five hours of time. 
Afterwards, both of them started having bad dreams. They went into deep states of depression. They went to see a psychiatrist or somebody. They did hypnotic regression, and all of a sudden the story comes out of their abduction, and this is the people that they said they saw on the ship. Now, the story was that these, whatever these guys were, were interested in a couple of things. Number one, the human body. Number two, hybridization. Because they took seed from both of them. Okay? Hybridization. Now, Whitley Strieber, he's already known for writing some novels that were turned into movies. Wolfen, if you've ever seen the movie Wolfen, that was his story. Go ahead. What time was that? In the 60s. Okay? Right. Okay. So, I mean, if you if you go back and look at history from the 40s into the 50s and the 60s, you got people all over the world seeing UFOs. So the the Air Force ran several studies. One of the first one was called Project I don't I don't want to get the name wrong, so I'm not going to say it. The second project they did was Project Grudge, and then they did Project Blue Book. Okay? And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But they were studying cases of people seeing UFOs. Okay? So this all happened 40s, 50s, starting in the 40s, into the 50s, into the 60s. And especially in the 50s, people were seeing these things everywhere. Okay? So, good question. I appreciate you asking that. Whitley Strieber then finally writes a story, true story, that he's being abducted in the middle of the night he's got creatures in his room lifting him up out of his bed floating him through the walls of his house taking him into a ship here's what i found out about streber streber before all these alien encounters he's doing types of transcendental meditation he's basically making phone calls to spirits and they come and they stole him multiple times now I'm gonna say this in a sort of a PG rated way this creature here was not one of these short grays she was taller and she had multiple encounters with Whitley Strieber and he said it was the most intense thing he had ever experienced. And he was fine with this. Okay? He is still alive. His wife has now died. And Whitley Strieber is going around doing talks saying death is a myth. There is no such thing as death because when his wife died, he followed her through the cosmos up into a point where he had to turn around and come back. But she's still alive and she is still talking to him and she and him are writing a book together, even though she's dead. Now, it's not her, is it? It's a familiar spirit. Okay. But he believes this. And he says, even though they act in a bad way, he says, ultimately, I think they are on our side wanting humanity to evolve so that they can get along with us in a higher plane this is dr john mack harvard professor when you are a harvard professor you are at the top of the food chain okay alan dershowitz harvard law chuck schumer harvard law if you go to harvard number one you got to have a ton of money number two you got to be smart okay and John Mack is a Pulitzer Prize winning psychiatrist. He's written several books. He's at the top of his field. He gets involved with a guy who's doing regressions on people who's saying they're being abducted by aliens. This catches his attention somehow, some way. He's going, I want to figure this thing out. So he starts interviewing people who said they've been abducted. 
and he does hypnotic regression with them. He, does, he performs all sorts of tests on them, and he says, number one, these people are not psychotic. They are normal human beings who live normal lives, who have had an experience that I cannot tell you where it's coming from or what it is. So he writes a book called Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. Immediately, Harvard says, you can't do that. We're Harvard. Harvard was, at one time, maybe still is, a seminary. So Harvard, Alan Dershowitz, they actually interviewed him, and he said, you can talk about gods, you can talk about aliens or angels, you can even talk about Satan at Harvard. You can't talk about aliens. So they formed a committee to examine John Mack's work, whether or not they were going to kick him out of Harvard or not. They decided not to. And now you have some other Harvard professors that are, think, are thinking along the same lines as John Mack. John Mack is dead. He was killed in a car accident. That, to me, was suspicious. Okay? So he wrote a couple of books about these people with alien abductions. And he writes, and he said, all of the... All of them are the same. They describe the exact same creatures. They look like this. They look like that. They look like that. They look like that. And he said, in every case, these entities were interested in hybridization. In every instance. Now, go ahead. Mm -hmm. why, why does that, so why did it work then and now they're trying to, I, mean, I don't get why. It's a good question. Ask God. Because right now I don't know the answer to that. Okay? And what he said, for those who can't hear, he said, why is it that it worked before the days of Noah, the sons of God and the daughters of men, but why not now? I don't know the answer to that. Okay? But to me, their fascination and their interest with hybridization that tells, but that links it with Daniel 2. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Okay? So then, this is all in the 90s. In the mid-90s, I'm going to say around 1994, the Ariel School, Ariel Elementary School in Zimbabwe. Um, Zimbabwe has a mixture of white and black, and they speak English. And at this school... There was about 100 students in this school. The teachers were having a meeting, so most of the staff was in a room. One staff member was sort of watching the kids while they were playing on the playground, and a disc landed toward the end of the playground. 62 of these children said these three little creatures came out. It seemed like they were floating across the ground. One girl said, she locked eyes with one of these and all of a sudden these images of like the end of the world were popping in her brain. Like the world was on fire and people were screaming and everybody was dying and it was the humans who were harming the planet type stuff. And this was reported by several of the students who said when we looked into their eyes, they put stuff in our brains. So John Mack went over there to interview these students and he said, they're not lying. All of them, this is not a schoolyard prank. All of them told the exact same story. Okay? So if, if your little boy came running in, Dad, I saw a flying saucer. Okay? Do what? Yeah. If 62 kids at a school of 100 all told the exact same story, something happened. Something happened. They didn't make this up. And John Mack said, if this is real, and I've, I've got it hidden here, if this is real, what does this mean? He said, I'm going to have to change my whole outlook on the universe. Because he said, these kids were not lying. Something happened. Yes, Jason. I think it's interesting also to this point about when we're talking about these spirits, uh, you're talking about fornication, you're talking about hybridization, all those other things. 
that all, and you might be getting to this, so I don't want to uh, interfere, but all through the scriptures, God warns us and shows us the example of spiritual fornication. Yep. And physical fornication. Exactly. He shows it, both of them, and they're, they're almost nearly inseparable. Think about this. When you see these charismatics and all these people that get caught doing all their weird stuff. They're very adulterous. Exactly. They get caught. First, they got the spiritual fornication stuff yeah. that they're doing with other gods and other gods. all that other stuff. And then you find out later, well, they've been doing all this other wicked stuff. Yeah. Uh, fornication and perversion and everything else. So it's not like there's not a pattern all the way through the scriptures yeah. of that. And I guess another theory I might have to add to this is my theory about that. Somebody says, well, why hasn't it worked? Well, number one, we don't know if it's worked. Right. We don't know. They could be out there and yeah. we don't know that because we don't know everything. The second thing is, is that it could be a timing thing when those angels that left their first estate were when they were placed into... The second group of them, which I believe were the four, are the four that are bound in the river Euphrates. That's interesting. That's yeah. my theory. I, my theory is that they repopulated Canaan. Those yeah. four, they were bound there. They're going to be loose sometime. All hell is going to break loose, literally, in, yeah. in Revelation chapter 9. But my point is, is that it may be that because it's not time yet. He said as in the days of Noah. Right. When you take that back to the days of Noah, there's a lot of things they were allowed to do that we can't do now yeah. yet. So that's my theory. All right. Deuteronomy 28, God promised a nation of fierce countenance. I believe that these devils fulfill that. They are a nation of fierce countenance. Daniel 8, 23, a king of fierce countenance is coming. Okay, and God said, which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. In Deuteronomy 17, let's study the gods, because we know the gods were all throughout the Old Testament. And God warned Israel multiple times, don't worship other gods. So notice the warnings that God gives in Deuteronomy. Chapter 17, verse 2, if they be found among you within any of thy great gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant and hath gone and served other gods, plural, not another God, gods, and worship them either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven. What is the host of heaven? It's the angels and the stars, which I have not commanded. And it be told thee that thou hast heard of it and inquired it diligently and behold it be true and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel. Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing under thy gates and even that man or that woman shalt stone them with stones till they die. Whenever the punishment of stoning with stones was commanded, it's a foreshadowing of Christ in Daniel 2 who is the stone cut without hands who comes and destroys, lands on the ten toes and causes that whole image to fall and turn into dust and it's blown away with the wind. That's what I see. So when everybody, when they're stoning somebody with stones in the Old Testament, it's a foreshadow of Christ destroying the kingdom, the fourth kingdom, so that he can establish his kingdom on this earth. Deuteronomy 13, certain men, children of Belial, can we take that literally? I believe so. Are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of the city saying, let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire, make search and ask diligently and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. God said, kill them all. They're dangerous. Deuteronomy 32. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods. So now God is linking the two together. The gods with the little g are devils. Devils do not come from the departed souls of giants. That comes out of the book of Enoch. That's a lie. Devils are gods. 
They're called devils, gods with a little g, unclean spirits, familiar spirits. Okay? There's different types of spirits, but they're all evil. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. An angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you to the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice, which ye have done this. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides. So we know what Paul said the thorns were. Messengers of Satan. And their gods shall be a snare unto you. Their gods. Psalm 82. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. Turn to Psalm 82. This is fascinating. To me, Psalm 82 spells it out in no uncertain terms that the sons of God were, in fact, angels. Because he says it in Psalm 82, almost in those exact words. The gods, ye are gods. This is God saying to this group, ye are gods. Now think about what that means. They are higher than us. God has made man a little lower than the angels. Angels and gods are immortal. They do not die. We do. Okay? So watch what happens. I have said ye are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. So the sons of God are gods. But, verse 7, ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Princes are principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, things that we wrestle against. Amen? The, the ones that show up on certain days to try to eat you up, to try to cause you to abandon faith. And you wrestle with them and say, get, out, get away from me. Leave me alone. Leave my family alone. Amen. So here's what happens, because I'm thinking, OK, these chariots are spirits. These aliens are devils. Why in the world did they crash? Because I'm going, they're angels, they're like gods, they don't have to crash. Because in Ezekiel one, the chariots, the four living creatures and their wheels, they went from here to there like lightning and back again. They had the ability to move at extremely high speeds, stop on a dime without deceleration, move at incredible speed without acceleration. I mean, they had this amazing ability to do all this. And yet, so I, I did, I God, I don't understand that. So I wouldn't say a word about Roswell. I spent year, all these years in this ministry. I talked about everything else, but I would not talk about Roswell because I'm going, I can't reconcile it with scriptures. And last year before I came here, one o'clock in the morning on a Thursday night, God said, I said, you're gods, but you shall die like men. And I went, that's it. That's it. They come here. They're doing things they're not supposed to be doing. And God says, fine, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to allow you to fall, crash your ship, and I'm going to allow you to die like men. Turn to, uh, you want a second witness to that? Turn to Ezekiel 28. I love this Bible. This King James Bible, it had, listen, I'm telling you, the Masons even know it. You go into Masonic Lodge, on their altar is a square and compass sitting on top of a King James Bible. Because where's their secret? It's in this book. And every Masonic symbol represents the joining together of heaven and earth. Every Masonic symbol represents that. So Ezekiel 28 Verse 2, Son of Man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, he's a principality, 
Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God. But he put a capital G here. I said in the seed of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a what? A man and not God. So something about them changes. There was actually a movie made about this. City of angels. Do you see it? Because this angel, Seth, falls in love with Meg Ryan. I mean, who doesn't fall in love with Meg Ryan? Okay. Everybody in every movie falls in love with Meg Ryan. So this angel, Seth, falls in love with a human woman. And he wants to be with her, but he can't. So he finds a guy named John Messenger, who is a man in the hospital. And he smokes and he drinks and he eats junk food all the time. And he's got his art, his arteries all clogged up. And he tells Seth, the angel, he says, I know you're there. I can't see you, but I know you're here. So you go back and tell the boss that I'm not ready to die yet. So he meets him at a restaurant, finds out that John Messenger used to be one of those angels. And he wanted to become human. He said, you know, how do you do it? You fall. So Seth got up on top of this big building and just fell off. He landed on the street. Now he's got blood coming down. Now he's got a human body. And then he makes it with Meg Ryan. City of angels. This Bible actually said it before the movies did. So in Ezekiel 28, he becomes a man. He falls, takes, and he dies like man and fall like one of the princes. So in Revelation 6, and I beheld, and when he opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. What did they hear at Pentecost? A rushing mighty wind. So God's going to shake the heavens. And these things are going to fall. So Revelation 12. We have the dragon whose tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. A third is what as a percentage? Infinite yeah, infinite threes. It keeps going because there's an innumerable company of angels. And yet God knows how to cut off one third of an infinite amount. You try that one. Amen. Isn't God smarter than us? Because where's the last number at? What's the highest number? There isn't one. And yet God is above that one. Amen. He's the most high. <laughs> yeah. So in Revelation 12, 7, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels cast out with them. They're coming. They're coming to the earth. They're going to fall because these princes fall. And they fall like the princes. So. What do these gods look like? Can I ask one question first? No. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, why, why do some of them choose to fall right away? You think just for power or to learn? Or, or um, I'm not sure I got your question. Oh, you're, I thought you indicated that they're falling and that's how they're communicating and doing all this kind of stuff. Some of them are, I believe, but not the whole lot of them. Right. Possible. I mean, I haven't talked to one of them, but some have. Some have. And you know what's funny about them? They speak a language that no one here knows. And that is exactly what God said about that nation of fierce countenance. He said, whose tongue thou shalt not understand. I'm telling you, I think this is that which is spoken by the prophets. So look at these Sumerian gods. What do you notice about this? What sticks out in your. The eyes. Look at this. What is that? Yeah. 
the underside of a bigger saucer, wasn't it? Where? The underside of a bigger one. Here? This? Yeah, like the underside. Yeah. Of, yeah. It looks like it's connected to even a bigger one. A wheel in the middle of a wheel. Okay. Now, see this guy? Let me tell you where he is. Nazca, Peru. The Nazca Lines. You ever heard of those? Yeah. They've been there for a couple thousand years, and nobody knew they were there. They knew there was these markings in the, in the gravel. They didn't know what they were. 1940s, a guy flies over 10,000 feet in a plane. He looks down. He sees a monkey, a spider, a bird. And then on the side of a mountain, this is the whole side of a mountain here. This thing is thousands of feet tall, and he's one of these big god, big-eyed gods with his hand up like this, saying, Land here, or something like that. But that thing's been there because it never rains there, ever, to wash it away. And that thing's been there a couple thousand years. And it's huge. How could somebody on the earth carve that out from just being down on the earth? What do they look like? Look at this. Steven Spielberg is such an antichrist. Do you ever see the movie E.T.? Does E.T. fall from the sky? Does he die? Does he come back to life? Does he ascend into the heavens? There's your story. Anybody ever see the movie Starman? With um, Jeff Bridges? He fell from the sky took on the body of a man, mated with the woman, told the woman, that child of yours is going to be a great teacher on the earth. And then he ascended back into the clouds. Who's writing these movies? Let me, let me tell you who it is. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What do you notice? The eyes. Oh, I didn't, um, oh, come on. Quit making lines. There. Uh, here they are here. This is the same thing I showed you all ago. See these guys here? What do they look like? A guy in Pea Ridge, Arkansas, actually, I think he must have grew up the way I grew up. There was a show... I, I got up early on Saturday. Yep. I got up early on Saturday so I wouldn't miss any cartoon. And I would watch the farm report until the cartoons came on. And my favorite show was Land of the Lost. Land of the Lost, they had these reptilian-looking gods. One of them was named Enoch. Remember that? Dun, dun, dun. What did they look like? What do these gods look like? Lamb. Lamb. E.T. These are the Japanese versions of it. What do you notice? The eyes. This is a female one. Here's more of them. Had, did people see these things? I believe they did. I believe they did. This is uh, a site in the Middle East. They dug these figurines up. This one is carrying a child, like Madonna and child. Reptilian. Who remembers the Coneheads? Remember that? Where did they get the idea from that? Here's more of them. See the eyes and the large heads, cone heads? These are gods. Here's the Chinese version of it. Same thing. Fierce countenance. Big eyes. These are their gods. Okay? Look at these. Look at that. Yeah, that's like gross. 
You're not supposed to do that. There's a virus going around, you idiot. Look at these guys. This is Aboriginal art here in Australia. Did they see them? Sure they did. Now, here's the verse I told you about. Psalm 68, 17. If you want to turn there in your Bible, underline it. Now, I don't know why God chooses this. But God uses his creation. God cohabitates with his creation in that he works with them. And so, just like you have four Levite priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was the throne of God, you have four living creatures carrying the chariot of God. The four living creatures are the chariot of God. So it says, Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000 even thousands of angels. So you could read this verse as the chariots of God are 20,000 angels. His chariot is a living entity with a spirit that is in the wheels. The wheels had the spirit of the living creature in it. They were joined together so that wherever the angels wanted to go, the wheels took them there. Okay? And all they had to do was wish it and will it. And the wheels took them there. And... I have listened to guys, military guys, say one of the things we're figuring out about these recovered craft is they are operated by the mind. Okay? You ever heard of Robert Lazar? Bob Lazar is the guy who made the world aware of a place called Area 51. He worked at a place away from that called S4. He got hired by a company called EG&G. They were a government contractor. He had a above top secret clearance. He had what's called a majestic clearance. And he worked on, they, they, they debriefed him. He read all these documents because he thought when he first saw one of these discs at S4, he said, that's what those are. Everybody's talking about UFOs and what they are is the government made these. But then they debriefed him. And he said they had nine hangers and each hanger had a different kind of ship in it. And he said one of them he read in the documents was dug up that was thousands of years old. It had crashed a long time ago. This has been going on. And so his role was they were all trying to back engineer these discs so they would work. He even knew that on Wednesday nights at a certain time at night that they would be testing some of these craft because he took some friends out and they videotaped it. He knew exactly when they were going to be testing these craft. So what happened was he went to, um, can't remember, he was a reporter in L.A. and... Um, he was interviewed, his face was blacked out, and he told everybody, for the first time ever, I worked at a place called S4, it's at Area 51, and I worked on reverse engineering alien spacecraft. And they asked him a few questions, and then he came out and with his face and his name and made a video about what he saw, what he did, how they worked, an element called Element 115 that at the time had not even been discovered, but since has been discovered. And he said, element 115 is what they use to power the craft somehow, some way. So all of a sudden now, when they start investigating his background, there's no record of him anywhere of going to elementary school, high school, college, nothing. It's like he didn't exist. But they did find a telephone directory from one of the companies that he said he worked for and his name and his phone number was in it. Even though the reporter called and said, do you ever heard of a Bob Lazar? We've never had a Robert Lazar work for us. We have no record of it. But then he found that they were lying because his name was in a phone directory for the company. Okay. So anyway, that's what Lazar reported. Ezekiel 1, we've already went through some of this. I'm not going to spend much time on it. 
But we've seen how the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels as part of the chariot of God. Even Solomon, when Solomon built his temple and he made the place in the most holy place of where the Ark of the Covenant was going to sit, look at what he did. In verse 32, and under the borders were four wheels. The axle trees of the wheels were joined to the base and the height of the wheel was a cubit and a half cubit. And the work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel. Their axle trees, knaves, fellows, and their spokes were all molten. Axle trees, knaves, fellows, spokes. One, two, three, four. Spiritual realm. When Solomon made what the platform that he was going to put the Ark of the Covenant on, he literally made a chariot with wheels for the Ark of the Covenant to sit on in his temple. Because he knew what it was. It was God on his chariot. And it came to pass as they still went on. What, what appeared to Elijah and Elisha? A chariot of fire and horses of fire. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is Elisha is with his servant. And they're surrounded, right? By all these enemies, chariots. And his servant's going, we're dead. They're going to kill us all. They're more than there's a servant said unto him, alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray that you open his eyes and he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of what? Dun, 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 dun. That's where they got this from. Chariots of fire. What were they? Angels. They were angels. The chariots were. And they whooped that army. Amen. Whooped them. Yep. <laughs> Zechariah, I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, there came, there came four chariots out from beneath between the two mountains. Mountains were mountains of brass. And the first chariot were red horses. Second chariot, black horses. Third chariot, white horses. And in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel to talk with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel said, these are the four what? Spirits. The chariots were the spirits. The chariots were angels, like the Bible says they were. So I want you to think about this. What is, what is all of the American and European and whatever car companies making? Living chariots. The last time I was here, last year, I rented a car. And it kept turning the steering wheel on me. And that freaked me out. I'm going, Lisa, what is this thing? It's this thing keeps turning. And I figured out that it was keeping me between the lines. And I'm going, I can do this on my own. I don't need your help. Yeah, apparently not. That's what my wife said. Get out of here. The enemies have chariots. Look. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thee, be not afraid of them. That was fulfilled back here with Elisha and his servant. Right. Elisha knew what God said. God said, don't be afraid of them. When you see those chariots, don't be afraid of them. Tell them to leave. Since last year, I had people write to me and tell me their encounters with aliens devils gods in their house middle of night in the name of jesus get out of here boom gone absolutely okay our enemies have chariots look at first kings 20 ben hated the king of syria gathered all his hosts together there were 30 and two kings with him and horses and chariots so 32 kings with ben hadad makes 33 And the coronavirus, corona is Spanish word for crown. And its initial designation was Corona 33. Let me show you that tomorrow night. Your pastor said, yeah, so look what he did. He burned the chariots of the sun. I would love to know what that was. 
Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and horsemen because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek to the Lord. And let me tell you, you does anybody know who Tom DeLonge is? Blink-182, rock and roll star, formed a company called To The Stars Academy. He hired CIA guys, Department of Defense guys, to work for him because he says they have what they call tangibles. They have pieces of technology that they're working on back engineering. And Tom DeLong believes that we are set to make contact with these gods. Stephen Greer leads people out to mountains, to the beach, out in the desert, does this all the time. He's going to release a documentary this year called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. Close Encounters of the Third Kind is you have ET contact. Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, the ETs grab you in the middle of the night. Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind is that we call ET to come down here. And Stephen Greer wants these aliens to come down here to evolve us and give us their technology so we can be like the gods. Live forever. Does this make sense now? Man. Look at all these chariots that the gods rode. What did they look like? Look at this. Look at that. Look here. Wheels inside of a wheel. Apollo rode a chariot. He, Apollo was the sun god and the chariot drove him across the sky every day. The Hindu sun god Surya rode in a chariot. The go these gods ride in chariots, by the way. The Vimanas from the ancient Vedas, the Sanskrit text, depicted chariots of the gods flying through the heavens, able to go anywhere at almost any speed. That's exactly what Ezekiel said they had the ability to do. I'm moving through some of this kind of fast. This was discovered recently. It's one of the oldest cave paintings in the world. Um, hang on. Yeah. Come on, let me. Look at that guy. That's what um, Stephen Greer saw. That's what John Mack Everybody told John Mack that they saw. That's what Betty and Barney Hill saw. That's what Whitley Strieber saw. Um, let me move through some of this. I've got this on video. I'm going to release it this afternoon. These are Apollo, Gemini, and uh, Mercury 7 astronauts. They all saw UFOs. Edgar Mitchell. That's who I was trying to think of a while ago. Here's what astronaut Edgar Mitchell said on camera. There have been craft that have been recovered. There has been a certain amount of reverse engineering that has allowed some of these craft or some components to be duplicated. And there are those who are utilizing some of this equipment in certain ways and perhaps a large part of the activity that's classified as UFO activity may very well not be due to ET activity. He said, if there are ETs at all, I do not see anything that suggests really malevolent intent or hostile intent. And Edgar Mitchell said there is smoking gun evidence that has not or cannot be brought forward at this point, which means he knows that we have recovered craft. Okay, Gordon Cooper, he said, I he's one of the uh, Mercury 7 astronauts. He said, I believe these ET vehicles are crews visiting this planet from other planets. Now, let me read this. He said this on camera. He's now dead. But before he died, he gave an interview. Gordon Cooper was working at Edwards Air Force Base and he said, I was having some of the cameramen film precision landings. A saucer flew right over them, put down three landing gears, landed out on the dry lake bed. They went out with their cameras towards the UFO. It lifted off and flew off at a very high rate of speed. I had a chance to hold the film up to the window to look at it. Good close up shots. There was no doubt in my mind that it was not that it was made someplace other than on this earth. In my opinion, they are worried that they would panic the public if they knew that someone had vehicles that had this kind of performance, so they started telling lies about it. Then I think they had to cover it up with another lie. Now they don't know how to get out of it. Okay? Now, I, I've got more, but I'm dead tired. Here's what I'm telling you. I know this sounds 
Freak E. They're making movies all the time about humans and alien contact. In some cases, the aliens are bad. In some cases, the aliens are good. One of the recent ones was called Arrival, where 12 alien ships showed up around the world. They spoke a language that nobody understood, but this one woman, this one woman, finally, it was downloaded to her what the language meant. And the language was actually a way that we would help the aliens in the future when the aliens and us joined together. That was a rival. Came out recently. Okay? I believe that this world is being prepared for a great falling away. These angels are going to fall. Man is going to fall. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Father, if I've spoken anything that is not true, based upon what I've seen, what I've heard, Father, I pray you should forgive and help us to forget. Help us, dear God, to hold only to the word of God in its truth. Bless your word in Jesus' name. All of God's people said.